Welcome to worship today at Grace Lutheran Church in Boone, North Carolina. Thrilled to welcome you as we gather to worship. I do have a few announcements before we get started. A uh, reminder that tomorrow, September 2nd, the church office will be closed in observance of Labor Day. Uh, next Sunday, we will have our miniature golf activity, and that's also the day we're going to, after our in-person service, go over and bless uh, our new youth room. Uh, plus, we're going to use it as a kickoff for all of our faith formation activities for children, youth, and family. Uh, but today, I want to highlight some of our adult faith formation opportunities that are emerging this fall. Uh, starting next Sunday on the 8th, I'll, I will be getting... I will be beginning a new adult faith formation series on the book, The Great De-Churching. And we'll cover one or two chapters every week, kind of as we make our way through the fall. So you're welcome to join us in person or on Zoom at 8.30 a.m. Or just get a copy of the book and read alongside us. I think it provides some really interesting information based upon a study of church participation. But if Sunday mornings at 8.30 is a little too early or not really your time, we do have some other opportunities. One is uh, uh, Tyler Ruddy is going to be leading a book study. It'll be every other Thursday starting this Thursday, September the 5th, in the chapel over here at 6 o'clock. They'll be studying uh, Kate Baller's No Cure for Being Human. In addition, uh, Tyler will be leading uh, Theology on Tap again this year. Uh, that'll begin on September the 13th at 5.30 over at South End Brewing. But that's not all. We also have a, a young adult Bible study that will be resuming. Uh, James Holden will be leading that. It will be on Sunday evenings at 5.30. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunities to jump in uh, to a variety of our faith formation learning times together. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, 
who forgives our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin and come to God for healing, kneeling as we are able. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have honored you with our lips, but have harmed our neighbors with our tongues. The cravings at war within us cause conflicts and disputes. In our desire to be first, we make distinctions among ourselves. We place the needs of the poor and the suffering last. In your great mercy, forgive us our sins. Draw near to us with grace in time of need, and turn us to follow the way of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God promises to forgive our iniquity and to remember our sin no more. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, the source of eternal healing, your sins are forgiven. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. God, our strength, without you we are weak and wayward creatures. Protect us from all dangers that attack us from the outside, and cleanse us from all evil that arises from within ourselves, that we may be preserved through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrine. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, adverse, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I had a conversation with a member of the congregation recently uh, about the, the rising talk about evil in the world. You know, some years ago, I don't remember people talking about evil all that often. Uh, but these days, it seems more and more, especially in the political realm, that we are becoming more comfortable labeling those with whom we disagree, not just as wrong, but in fact, evil. And my sense is that this move, uh, to not just disagree with good intentions, but instead to, to name someone as apart from God or a force that defies or opposes God, is a move that is actually more of a political maneuvering than it is an indication of the nature of our relationships. In essence, what I'm saying is that things like what we hear about in our text today that we speak about in the church related to evil have been commandeered and utilized in political conversation in a way that not only further deepers the divide that we experience, but actually creates an impassable divide on the side of good versus evil. You know, the truth is that we want to think we're right most of the time. 
We like to think we are on the right side of history, we have God on our side, and that when we oppose someone else, they are opposing God, they are opposite. But I guess I grow really concerned when we name our neighbors as evil. And the reason is that when we name someone as evil, not just difference of opinion, but evil, we can begin to excuse all sorts of terrible behavior on our part, which we justify because they are evil. We can excuse all sorts of behaviors in our own lives because we justify it as one fighting against the evils of this world. Now, pastor, you might say, isn't there evil in the world? Doesn't Jesus talk about there being evil in the world? The answer is yes. There are evil forces at work that defy and separate us from God. But here in our passage, Jesus makes it pretty clear that the evil that we might need to contend with may need to begin with an inward look. Instead of labeling our neighbors as evil, we may need to start taking more seriously the things within ourselves that defy and oppose God's good design for us. And that question of how our lives embody the wholeness and fullness of what God has designed sits at the heart of some of these questions about washing. The controversy here is that Jesus' disciples are eating food uh, but not washing their hands first, which is kind of gross, we can agree. Uh, but it's not just that, it's that there are these other ritual washing things that people are supposed to do. And you might go, well, yeah, that's good hygiene. That's a good idea, something that we maybe all should be washing our hands before we eat, and I think that's true. But the origin, the history of washing, actually had to do more with holiness. The washing practice was about washing away the things that piled up, the dirt that collected on our lives, in order to reveal the Holy One that we were called and created to be. So that ritual washing had a spiritual element to it in terms of clearing away the debris from our lives that stop us from living fully into our created being. And so the argument here is over whether or not the disciples put water on their hands, but Jesus changes the topic as he tends to do. And he says, no, 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 it's about how do our lives embody the full holiness as they were created to be? And Jesus diagnoses it as something different. While some might say the thing we need to do is keep ourselves apart from the world, to keep ourselves protected, to be set apart and holy so we don't accumulate those things, Jesus says, well, all those things that accumulate and bury and cover up our pure and holy selves, well, those things actually come from within, not from outside of us. Jesus is beginning to reframe the tradition with a deeper focus on oneself. And I think the, the message we could take here today is maybe to be really careful about worrying about what's outside of us and what's evil and what's good, and maybe taking a closer look within and wondering what needs to be moved out of the way so that who we were always created and called to be can flourish and live more fully. Lutherans have a, you know, talk about this pretty often. We begin every worship service with a confession because we recognize that our life tends to pile things on top of who we were created to be and it gets in the way. And that confessional time strips away those things and allows more of our full self to emerge. But it doesn't happen perfectly every time. <laughs> In fact, the, the promise of fulfilling that is, a, is an eternal type promise, not an earthly one, but it doesn't mean our striving against evil from within ourselves isn't something that we continue each and every day. The promise here is the same as what the Israelites received in the Old Testament, and that is our relationship with God makes us holy. 
and there are things that pile up on top and shield it. But we believe that in Jesus and this process of confession, we can reveal more and more our own holiness. But it's not going to happen if we avert our gaze away from ourselves. It's not going to happen if we don't take seriously what's going on within us and instead are quick to name our neighbor as evil. Jesus is contending with the religious leaders because lines are being drawn that are keeping certain people out. And they're being drawn by people who are diagnosing their neighbor as evil. And he's speaking to those people who have the power to draw the lines and say, you know what, look more deeply within yourself first before you worry about what your neighbor is doing. Later, Jesus will say something to the effect of, don't worry about the, 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 the splinter or the speck in your neighbor's eye before you've taken care of the giant log in your own. In essence, it's some, a similar kind of message and same kind of controversy that Jesus is having with the religious leaders. The good news is our lives are holy. We believe that happens in baptism. And we also have an opportunity to confess. When we look deeply within, we can take all those things that, that, that sit on top of who we really are, and we can hold them up to the light of Christ and go, no, those things don't have to have power over us anymore. But yet at the same time, we have to recognize that we're not perfect. And it should stop us short of naming our neighbors as evil. And we may need to confess that we bought into some of the narratives about the other, however you might define it. We've consumed a little too much of things they call news but are in fact not, that, that draw deeper divisions between us and our neighbors, cause us to try to figure out who's evil, who's against us, so we know how to fight them, so we can excuse all sorts of behaviors on our own part, because the other is evil. And instead, look deeply within ourselves to see maybe those things that need to be confessed and put away. And then when we look at our neighbor, we're looking for the holiness that's buried within. We look at our neighbor and we try to see our neighbor the way God sees our neighbor, all the way down to the core as one who is a beloved child of God, the same way that we rest in that promise for ourselves. And my sense is that if we can start to look for the holiness in our neighbor and be more honest about some of, the own, some of our own shortfallings, we might better be able to see each other as companions in a journey of walking with God, as opposed to the enemy that needs to be defeated. Amen. With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn together in the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray with confidence for the church, God's good creation, and all who are in need. God of every generation, give the church a sense of purpose and belonging. Sustain and build up leaders as we accompany one another in our life with Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of creation, you named humans as co-creators with you. Guide governments and industry that environmental laws and practices seek to heal and not harm. Bring relief and justice to people in places suffering from climate catastrophe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sovereign God, we pray for local communities of every kind, rural and urban, established and new. Lead those in authority to seek the good of all through their words and actions, and to mentor others in honest and generous ways. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Healing God, you draw near to all who are hurting. Be with all who desire relief from chronic and acute illness, cancer, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Strengthen healthcare workers, therapists, and caregivers. Tend to those who are close to our hearts, whose names we now lift up to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. On this Labor Day weekend, we remember and give thanks for all who have fought for workers' rights around the world. Continue to improve working conditions and establish fair wages so that all people may thrive. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comforting God, console us as we mourn our departed. We hold fast to the promise that death has been defeated by our Savior Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We entrust these and all our prayers to you, holy God, in the name of your beloved child, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our worship continues now with the offering. If you'd like to, you can pause our worship video and using the QR code on the screen, go over to our website where you can donate in support of our mission here at Grace to share God's love so that all are served and supported. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, source of every gift of your creation. By these gifts and with our lives, help us to serve one another and all in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>
God Almighty, God Most Merciful, bless you, keep you, and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace, follow Jesus. Thanks be to God.